our guest is a multi-talented veteran with a career spanning almost 30 years. He is a video game composer, musician, sound designer, television personality, live show creator, director, creative director and producer, and the president of his very own video game company. He has worked on over 300 video game titles, including The Terminator, Earthworm Jim, Pac-Man World, Spider-Man, Advent Rising, and Metroid Prime. He is the creator of the concert series Video, game Li video Games Live, a multi-award winning symphony orchestra that has played video game music across the world since 2002. He founded the Game Audio Network Guild, which recognizes achievements in video game music and audio. He is an emeritus board member for the Game Developers Conference and a peer leader for the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences. In addition, he's co-hosted the telev television shows Electron uh, Electric Playground, sorry, Vic, and reviews on the run for G4 Network. He is currently the president of Intellivision Entertainment, which is launching the Amico console later this year. Please welcome a master of gaming, Tommy Tallarico. Yay, this is normally where you'd get a lot of applause, thunderous applause, right? Holy crap, <laughs> I sound busy. Jeez. Yeah, you do, man. Where do you, when do you sleep, Tommy Tallarico? <laughs> what the hell am I doing here? Uh, no, yeah, uh, <laughs> actually, it's funny. I was, uh, I was diagnosed as something called a super sleeper, which okay. is, I only need about four hours sleep a night. So I, I, oh. I, I only, uh, I only sleep four hours a night. I, I can't sleep more than that. It's weird. You're just like Batman. Yeah. That's, and I think he's, and, and, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. So we always start the, first of all, thank you very much. I've been wanting to get you to come and join us for a couple of years now. So I'm so glad we found this, this little moment in your schedule that we can uh, have you come on. So this, I'm, I'm thrilled to have you here. Now, we always start Masters of Game Design with a very hard question, and that is, Tommy Tallarico, what is your favorite game? Uh, I'm going to go with, uh, I, I think, one of the most perfect designed games, especially, and even for the time it came out, but still going back now and playing it. Um, not necessarily the game I would play the most, but, but from a perfection standpoint, Super Mario World on the Super Nintendo for me was like the graphics were beautiful, the audio was amazing, the level design that Miyamoto did. And, and I asked Miyamoto uh, when I worked with him on Metroid Prime, I asked him about Super Mario World and, and what were his secrets and his thoughts about, you know, how did he make that so great? And it was actually a funny story because he said, he goes, well, what we did, and, and Scott, you know this from, and me and Scott have worked on a number of, of big projects together, uh, you know, uh, back back on the PlayStation, PlayStation 2. Uh, we worked on great, amazing games. Um, but, and so one of the things that Miyamoto told me, and for those of you who don't know, Shigeru Miyamoto is like the Steven Spielberg of our industry. He's the greatest of all time. Uh, and always will be. He's the guy who created Mario and Zelda, and you know, Pikmin, everything from Pikmin to, to you name it. It, it, it was it was <laughs> great and amazing. It was probably yeah. It's Miyamoto. it's it's fair to say that Miyamoto invented the position of game designer, right? Yeah, really, he really did. Yeah, uh, Donkey Kong was his first game. So that's how, how about that for hitting it out of the park your first time at bat. Um, but, uh, and, and what he told me was really interesting because he said, um, and when I asked him about that game, how is it so perfect? How did you, you know, because when you work on games, like I said, as Scott will tell you, it's always about the time and budget, right? It's, it's how many months do we have to work on this game? And then there's a cutoff date because that budget is based around how many units, <coughs> excuse me, the sales department thinks they can sell, <laughs> you know? So, so everything's time and budget. And with Miyamoto, he really doesn't have that, right? Because they're gonna sell tens of millions of these things no matter what. But, but what, what he told me was really interesting. He says, look, we put a timeline together with the team and we said, this is what we wanna create. How long is it going to take us? And let's be conservative so we don't go over this and that. 
and they hit every milestone and they made it to the end. And then the trick up his sleeve was, now I'm going to give you all six more months to tweak it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, imagine all of the games that you worked on and we worked on together. Imagine at the very end when we were right about to deliver the gold master, you know, they, the, the word came down, hey guys, spend the next six months now and make it better. Like how great would everything, yeah. and we've worked on some great games together, how great would those games have been, right? So it's just a kind of an interesting thing. Right, absolutely. About Mario World. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a luxury that most game developers do not get. That's sadly. Right, that's right. All right. So so let me ask you before Miyamoto, before all this other great stuff, how did you get into gaming? What what was the the what was your your big opportunity, your big break that got you into gaming? Yeah, it's a great. Good question. It's a, it's a bit of a story, but uh, but it's an interesting one that hopefully people will appreciate and and take away uh, take away some some hints about getting in the industry. So, you know, my you know two greatest loves growing up were always music and video games. And you know, I'm I'm 53 year old years old now, so I was a part of Gen X, which were the first generation to grow up on video games and. You know, my very, you know, my first console was basically a Pong machine. It was called the Coleco Telstar. We got that in 1975. So I was seven years old. Um, and for those of you who didn't grow up in the late 70s, um, I mean, what an amazing time to be a kid. In 1976, oh, yeah. Rocky came out. In 1977, <laughs> Space Invaders came out. Arcades were busting. Star Wars came out for the first time. In 78, you had things like Van Halen. And, and uh, by 1980, you had, you know, uh, uh, Tron and 81 and E.T. And, uh, you know, and all these. It was just, and, and video games were booming. It was just the most amazing time to be a kid going like from 7 to 12, 13 years old when all this kind of explosion in pop culture was happening. <clears throat> so, so I got the bug early about video games and, uh, and it was always something I wanted to do. And when I, and I grew up on the East Coast in Massachusetts, in fact, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't have COVID, I swear. I just, I, <laughs> I got, let me, let me grab a drink here. So, um, so, when I turned 21, I come from an Italian family, 100% uh, Italian, and I'm the, oh, I'm the oldest son in an Italian family, like that means some shit, and, uh, and I have a younger brother and sister, and when I turned 21, I literally left my parents crying on the doorstep, uh, my family, it was everything I ever known, and I just got in my little two-seater car, uh, I had three t-shirts and a pair of jeans, and a couple of rolling keyboards and a little four track Fostex recorder. And I just drove out West and I didn't have any money. I didn't have a place to stay. I had no job. I had no friends out there, nothing. And, uh, you know, and, and, you know, my mom was giving me the speech, you know, Hey, you know, you can always come back. Don't worry about it. You can always come <laughs> back home. And, you know, my dad's like, go get him, kid. And, you, you, you know, I know, I believe in you and all this stuff. So I, I was fortunate to grow up with very supportive parents and yeah. supportive family unit. And, and I, lo always, I love your dad, by the way. I've never met your mom, but your dad is, I can tell everybody Tommy's dad is awesome. Yes, yes. He just turned 80 a couple of weeks ago. Oh, my and, gosh. Uh, well, happy birthday to him. Yeah. And, and. And, and he always instilled upon me, you know, positive mental attitude, uh, um, you know, always having, uh, you know, believing in yourself, making things happen for yourself. Don't wait around for shit to happen to you. You have to go out and take it kind of vibe, you know, and, and a big believer, if anyone's ever watched The Secret or read the book or Napoleon's Hills, Think and Grow Rich or any of these positive mental attitude books, that, that's how I live my life. Gratitude, vision boards, um, climbing mountains every day. And, and, um, and so 
when I went out to California, again, I, I literally had a credit card with $500. I was just using it for gas. And I bought a loaf of bread and peanut butter and jelly. And that kind of lasted me for the week. And when I got to California, I was homeless. Um, I was literally uh, sleeping under the pier at Huntington Beach. And um, I yeah. picked up a newspaper, though, the first day I was out there. And I saw a job for selling keyboards at Guitar Center. And I, you know, again, being from the East Coast, I'm like, okay, I can bullshit my way into that job. Uh, and so I, I walked into the Guitar Center in Orange County. And uh, I demanded to speak to the manager. And people are like, uh oh, we have a you know disgruntled customer. So I said, is the manager here? Yes, I'd like to speak to him. Oh, okay. And uh, and again, I'm 21 years old, right? Uh, fresh off the boat, as they would say. Uh, and and I walked in. Yes, sir, can I help you? I said, yes, you can. And I had the ad in the newspaper in my hand, and I and I threw it on his desk, and I said, I said, you can help me because I got the best news in the world for you. You don't have to look for anyone to fill this position anymore. I've arrived. And the guy's like <laughs> laughing. And, and he's like, he's like, you're not from around here, are you? You know, because because people <laughs> in California are like totally laid back. And, and you know, he could tell I was, he's like, are you from New York? Or where are you from? You know, and um, I, I said, yeah, I, I said, I'm, I'm Massachusetts. And my parents were in New York, but, um, and I said, yeah, I just got to town. He goes, got to town. I said, yeah, about three hours ago. And uh, and I said, look, isn't this great? You don't have to, I'm going to save you the time. You don't have to look at all those resumes. You don't have to like, oh gosh, you're going to have to spend like a half hour interviewing people. That's going to be a pain in the ass. I'm here. I'm in. I'll start now. And the guy liked my attitude so much. He's like, you know what? You're hilarious. Start tomorrow. They come come back tomorrow and you're hired. And I didn't even fill out an application. It was funny. And so, so again, I was homeless. And, 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 I'm, and I figured, look, if you're going to be homeless, you might as well do it on the beach in Orange County, California. I mean, the people I'm looking behind me, these people pay $20 million for these houses. I'm sitting here by myself, you know, uh, you know, getting the same view for free. Um, but Here's the crazy part of the story, if that wasn't. So I, like I said, I had three t-shirts. Well, one of those t-shirts was for a video game system that hadn't even come out in America yet. This is the late 80s. It was called the TurboGrafx-16. Scott, I'm sure you, you're very familiar with the yep. TurboGrafx-16. It was called the PC I, engine in yep. Japan. And the way I got this T-shirt, because if, if folks were around back in the late 80s, early 90s, you would know that there wasn't video game T-shirts. There was, it, you know, it wasn't, there wasn't a hot topic. There wasn't the internet. <laughs> Walmart didn't, and Kmart didn't stock video game T-shirts. They weren't the in thing. And so how did I get this T-shirt? Well, the summer before, I used to get all the video game magazines. And it was Bill Kunkel's magazine. You remember Scott, Bill Kunkel? Oh yeah, I remember Bill, yeah. Ele Electronic Games Magazine. And yep, it EGM. Had in there, and it said that TurboGrafx-16, and it listed like seven state fairs that they were going to be at. Ah, and right. You could try this new machine. And the closest one to me was in Toronto. It was about an eight-hour drive. And my poor mother, I made her go with me <laughs> and me and my mom drove to Toronto for eight hours just to go to the state fair, just so I could wait in line for two hours <laughs> to play this video game machine that no one had ever played before. And I played it and it was like Bonk's Adventure or something. And, and at the end, after playing it for like 15 minutes, they had me fill out a survey. So they were doing market research. They were doing a, you know, I was, I was, I was a game tester at that point, right? And, 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 and so for my troubles, they gave me a t-shirt, a TurboGrafx-16 t-shirt, which I still have to this day. And so what t-shirt am I going to wear on my first day at work? Well, this is my trophy. This is my, you know, this was my, my big thing to me. And so the very first day, I'm in California two days now, and now I'm wearing a TurboGrafx-16 t-shirt. And, and hand to God, God is my witness. 
the very first person who walked in the door, I don't know if you know him, Scott, or not, but you might even know the person, but his name was Seth Mendelson. And, ah. and Seth worked for Virgin Games, or it was called Virgin Mastertronic back then. He worked for Richard Branson, and Richard Branson was starting a Virgin video game company right down the street. Seth walks in, he sees this kid with a TurboGrafx-16 t-shirt on, and he says, holy crap, where did you get that? I'm like, oh, he's like, do you know about video games? I'm like, I know everything about video games. So I proceeded to download 21 years of my video game knowledge on this poor guy. And, uh, and so he hired me there on the spot. He said, he says, do you want a job? I said, yes, doing what? And he said, just, you know, do what you did to get that t-shirt. We'll just put, you <laughs> play, play the games and tell us what you think and find bugs and this and that. And uh, he just liked my attitude and my knowledge of video games. Uh, and I was the very first game tester ever hired at Virgin. Uh, and with, so I was, I was in California three days and I was in the video game industry and, nice. and, and after I would always bug the vice president of the company to, Hey, can I do music? Can I do music? Can I do music? I'll do it for free. If you don't like it, you don't have to use it, but please just give me the opportunity. And, uh, and, and I didn't know how to do music for video games back then. You pretty much had to be a computer programmer, but I had figured out a way to use MIDI, which stands for Musical Instrument Digital Interface, which that I knew on keyboards. And it's just basically the transfer of, because music is numbers, basically, you know? And so it was the transfer of those numbers. And so we created a hardware platform for me where I could take my MIDI keyboard and I could jack right into the sound chip of, the, the Game Boy and the NES and the Sega Genesis was just coming out. So I was able to play the sound chips right on the on the pian on my keyboard. And then we looped in, they were like version one of, of MIDI sequencers, which basically just mm -hmm. recorded the information from a synthesizer and it recorded it on a screen. And so and so we, I had basically created this way where I could use the systems to play music and then record it onto the computer. And I had to tweak everything by hand. So anyway, but, but they gave me the shot. And the very first game I worked on was the original Prince of Persia with right. Joel Beckner. And him and his dad had worked on, I think, the Commodore 64, the Apple II, whatever the first version was. And right. we were then doing a version for Nintendo and right and so this this for the Game Boy or for the for the, the NES Game Boy, the Game Game Boy, Boy okay yeah, which which basically it had the same chip the NES and the right. Game Boy were the same exact sound chip um and so we later took what I did on the Game Boy and then we ported that to the NES as well <clears throat> and um and so I wrote some music did some sound effects transported some music and it ended up like winning awards and big write-ups. And, and so they ended up making me the full-time music guy. But, but the whole thing about that story that I, that I want to tell folks is now some people might listen to that story and they might say, golly gee, you're so lucky, right? And, and I hate that word luck. Never use the word luck around me. Uh, it's insulting. Yeah actually yeah you know? I, I i agree 100 percent that yeah. there's that saying it says preparation meets opportunity that's that's what it is yeah so can you create your own luck okay sure but but you know was it lucky that i left my parents crying on the doorstep was it lucky <laughs> that i cried myself to sleep for two weeks alone scared in a car by myself as I'm going, you know, going across country, was it lucky that I was homeless? Was it lucky that I demanded to see the manager and, <laughs> and, and talked my way into the job? Was it lucky that I drove eight hours with my poor mom to get that Turbo Graphics T-shirt? You know, so so you know, always never wait around to, for your dream to happen to you. You have right. got to, got to, got to go out there and take it, my friends. You've got to take it. And don't blame anyone else except yourself. 
You know, you are in control of your own destinies and you got to make things happen. And, and, and the great thing about the video game industry, and Scott will back me up on this, I know, is that as huge as it is, $160 billion a year industry, blah, blah, blah. But within the industry, it's actually a pretty tight community, you know? Yep. And, and you, you can put yourself in positions to be successful in the industry. And I got news for you. It's not necessarily the most talented person who, <laughs> become, who gets the gig. So throw that shit out of your mind too. Talent is about 50% of it. I'm not the most talented composer, but I'm the most successful, right? So, and so what, what's the difference? The difference is consider 50% of it being 50% is talent, but the other 50%, and this will be if you take nothing away from anything today, please take this. The other 50% is networking. It's yeah. the ability to sell yourself to the people who you want to be in the, the same industry with. And, and, and so if people spent as much time networking and, and, and again, maybe it's just bettering yourself, you know, how to make friends and influence people, how to make anyone fall in love with you. Like there's so many amazing books, self-help books, because you might say, yeah, but Tommy, you know, I'm a bit of an introvert. Well, again, that's your crutch. Get rid of it. You can change <laughs> that. You can better yourself. You can learn how to get out of that. You got to be able to sell yourself. And, and, and Scott, me and Scott's relationship is a perfect example of this. What me and Scott first met, when Scott, I think you were at Namco at the time, we were yep. working on a game together called uh, Treasures of the Deep. I was yeah. doing the music, Scott was the producer, Black Ops was the developer, Namco was the publisher, but me and Scott had a really great working relationship I continued to impress Scott. Scott, what well, do you mean? I'll go you, I'll go you one further. I met you because I was working with Bill Anderson, who you had worked with at Virgin. At Virgin, and Bill was the yeah. designer of Aladdin. So, and so once again, it's that networking, right? I would yeah. say, hey, who's a good guy to make music? And Bill goes, well, of course, Tommy Tallarico. You got to have Tommy, right? So, right. yeah, so it it's all networking, right? It's all about, I mean, I tell my students all the time about 75 to 85% of every job I've ever gotten has been because of friends. It has 100%. nothing to do with, with you know, I mean, I like your strategy of going in there and saying, you're going to hire me. I'm the, I'm the best person right. for the job. But more often than not, it's because, right. hey, Tommy knows somebody and Tommy says, oh, I was talking to somebody and they need a game designer or they need a producer or whatever. Or I say, hey, somebody needs a musician. Oh, I know Tommy, whatever it all. And if you like each other and you're friends, then you want to work with each other. Exactly. And, and, and if I was a dick to Bill or if I was a jerk to Scott or whatever, then I wouldn't be here talking to you today. Right. And then Scott ends up leaving Namco and he goes to Capcom. Well, guess who Scott calls up when he's yep. working on his next game, you know? Goes because we had so much we had so much fun doing yeah. treasures. We had so much fun doing Pac-Man. And now I'm like, oh let's keep the let's keep the good times rolling. Let's get Tommy and and his gang That's in right. to help out. And so yeah. and so that it's so important for for folks, you know, watching to 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 understand that is that because I, so many times I see people spend all of their time just working on their talent as opposed to working on bettering themselves or networking with people. And you say, well, you know, how important is location? You know, hey, if I'm in such and such, you know, is it, is it better or is it easier these days with technology? And I, and I always say, look, do you want to go fishing in a pond that's smaller and has so that you have more opportunity to get a fish or, or but there's less fish or do you want to 
or do you want to go in a bigger pond with bigger fish and and more and a lot more fish and, and so that's the thing where putting yourself in that position so for example if you wanted to be an actor okay and you lived in atlanta you, your chances of being an actor as opposed to somebody who's in hollywood again because of that networking thing who knows who you're going to meet in line at starbucks who knows whose car is going to break down and you're there to give them a lift who knows a friend of a friend knows such and such right put right. yourself where the industry is if you want to be a fashion designer then go to milan go to new york go to paris don't go to nashville right but if, you, <laughs> but if you're looking to get into country music go to nashville and don't go to vancouver canada because that ain't gonna work out for you you know and so you always want to put yourself and and here's the deal everybody has a dream right everybody has this idea and dream in their head of they want to do something great or have their million dollar idea and I know a lot of successful people and they all will tell you the same exact thing. The, the difference between people who fail and people who succeed is that the people who succeed never give up and they're always, always working to reach their goal and they never take a day off from it, right? And so yeah. the way I look at my goals i i, I kind of envision them i picture them as a mountain that i have to climb and i i know that going getting to the top i know that there's going to be rocks falling down there's going to be sleet and snowstorms there's going to be rain there's going to be wind trying to knock me off i'm going to get to a spot where i can't move any further so i'm going to have to figure out a way around i'm going to have people from below tugging at my feet to try to drag me down but this is what i know i know that no matter what i will be at the top of that mountain I might not know exactly how I'm going to get there just yet, or all the things I'm going to have to get through to get there, but I will be there and nothing is going to stop me. So when, when you're in your career and you have that confidence, that is the single most important thing that you can have. You one and, and again, there's a fine line between confidence and arrogance, right? You know, being egotistical but and having confidence are two totally different things that are in the same area, but you need to don't ever feel like, oh, well, I don't want to come across as confident because somebody, you know, then somebody will think I, I'm an ego. Ego is like when you're looking down on people and when you think you're better than anyone else. Again, I've already told you here, I'm not the best game composer, game designer, or hardware CEO, but I'm going to be the most successful one, right? And so that that's confidence. You have to believe in yourself. That is the key to success and never giving up. Because I got news for you. There's 50 other people who want the same exact thing for as you do. And you got to outwork them every single day how can you do something that they're not doing and and that is the effort that you put in will pay off you got to so if you want to be a game designer you should be hooking up or uh, going to the game the, uh, the game developers conference in san francisco every you know early march that's right to 17,000 people in the industry all and that is your networking heaven but then there's also things like um the uh um with the local chapters of the igda international yeah. game developers association they have a so what a, what yeah. about what about musicians because i know that that uh there's like i always am getting messages from people who are like hey i'm a musician and i want to get into video games and i know that you have for example your um your game audio network guild, right? That, yeah, that yeah. what opportunities or what <coughs> strategies would you recommend for someone who wants to make music for video games nowadays? 
Yeah, so so audiogang.org is the website. It's a nonprofit. There's over 3,500 members in 40 countries. Um, it's a great way to network. That's why I created Game Audio Network Guild, which spells out gang. But the <laughs> network is so important, a, a part of that. Of course, if I didn't put network in, then it would just be called the Game Audio Guild, and gag is not a good name. But um, so... So, so that's, that's your first step is getting involved, but, but this carries over to everything though, for game designers, for game artists, for game producers, whatever, it's the same advice that I would give everybody too often when people are looking for jobs too often, what they do is they want to impress you. And, 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 you know, you're taking your time because, hey, you have to focus on me. I'm this special person. And let me do, let me tell you why I'm so special in this and that, right? What you got to do instead, and this is the part of the story about Guitar Center I left out. What I did was, the thing to remember is anyone in a position of power, and I don't care what career you have or what job you're in when you're in a position of power you always have too much on your plate and that will never ever go away so instead of going in when you're networking with people instead of going in saying hey me 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 hire me 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 the better approach is hi I'm Tommy Tellerico. How can I help you? How can I take something off of your plate? I'm willing to do that for free. Give me anything. I don't care if it's sweeping your floors or, 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 or running a FedEx, whatever it is. But are there things on your plate right now that I can take off free of charge? I'm willing to do that. And every single person has at least two or three things that are backed up at that very second, you know? Yeah. Um, and so having that kind of approach to say, and, and again, that was kind of my approach with, with the guy at, at, at Guitar Center, right? Was, look, I'm going to save you a whole shitload of time. Isn't this great? And the guy sitting there going like, fuck yeah, that is great. She, you know, that, like that's literally two days I'm going to have to do this crap for. This guy's awesome. I'm going to hire him. And so, so always go in with that belief because so many times people make the mistake of look at me, look at me, look at me, as opposed to how can I help you? It's a great way to get your foot in the door. Right. No, that's great advice, Tommy. And, and definitely something that I've seen in action many times over my career with friends. Now, one of the things that I, I, I mean, there's so much stuff we could talk about, but I'm, I'm trying to hit kind of the high points here. Um, one of the things that's always impressed me about you is that you're always innovating. You're, you were like the first dude I knew who made an album of, of video, video game, game music. You were the, I remember when you came to, now I don't know, if, I'm not going to take credit. I, I, my memory, I'm getting old. So my memory is not as good as it used to be, but was, I remember you coming to me on Maximo and saying, I really want to do live orchestra music for this game. <laughs> was that the first game you actually did that on? Was for uh, Maximo? Uh, it was one of them. It was, it was in the first month or so. Yeah. We, we Okay. It was, it was Maximo, and we were also working with uh, Electronic Arts on um, with Michael Giacchino on Medal of Honor. Oh, but, nice. But yeah, that, yeah. That, but that was definitely within the first couple of weeks. So, yeah, I would say it was, yeah, that was one of the pretty, ones. Exactly. Pretty, pretty close up there. So what, yeah. so, so at when, like, what did you do? What, what, what happened in the industry that allowed you to all of a sudden, like, do this? Because obviously this is the spark that gets you to video games live eventually right would you say that's fair to to say right yeah, like working sure. with the orchestra and and all that so 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 tell us about that because this is a pretty important i think moment in in game music history yeah well you know again like you had mentioned i was the very first person to come out with a video game soundtrack album and again this is in the early 90s and yeah. it was on capitol records 
right? <laughs> and it was called Tommy Tellerico's Greatest Hits Volume One. I had a greatest hits before I even had a career. It was amazing. <laughs> and, and But I had convinced Capitol Records to put out this album of video game music. And they're like, who the hell would listen to video game music? Don't people turn that off? And I'm like, listen to this. And, and people, and, and they listened to it and were like, wow, this is actually good music. And, and so, um, so that was innovative. And anyone told me I was crazy and I was nuts and no one would ever listen to video game music. Now it's, now it's common. And then before Video Games Live, and Scott, you remember this because you were on the show as well, you know, me and Vic came up with Electric Playground and then Reviews on the Run and Judgment Day, where we were, again, this is 1994, okay? And imagine me and Victor Lucas walking into ABC, NBC, Fox, MTV, Discovery Channel. <clears throat> this is before G4. <clears throat> and saying, hey, we want to do a TV show about video games. And in the mid 90s, video games were like the antichrist to television because TV numbers were going down because kids were playing their Sega Genesis and their PlayStation 1 as opposed to watching TV. And so, and, and I remember these TV executives going, so wait a second, you want us to put a video game TV show on? So what? After they watch your show, they're going to turn our network on and go play the video games. Get the hell out of here, you know? And again, this is pre-internet. This is pre-YouTube. This is pre-Twitch TV. So here we are again. We're creating things. See, my grandfather, who came over from Italy, always told me, he says, you know, do, when you do something you love, you'll never work a day in your life, right? And so. I was doing things that I wanted to see done. Like I would love to hear video game music in an album, but no one's doing it. So does that mean that I say, oh, well, I guess I'll wait for somebody to do it. No, I was like, well, I'm gonna be the first then. I'll go and do it. With the television show, when they kicked us out of the office, we could have said, oh, well, I guess that's, I guess no one's interested, no. We got up enough money. We shot a pilot episode. Uh, in, in fact, Mike Fisher was on that pilot episode, oh. the, the marketing VP of marketing at Namco. Uh, yeah. And we did, actually our very first episode ever was Treasures of the Deep. Uh, we, we had that big event. Uh, it was Ace Combat, Treasures of the Deep, and, mm. and, the, uh, and the Time Crisis. Um, oh, two out of three of my games on it. That's, that's awesome. Right, exactly. <laughs> and I worked on two of those three games as well. Um, and, and so, and so that was, uh, we just did it. If it didn't exist, that doesn't mean we take our toys and go home. That means we create it. And the same thing with video games live. I said, boy, wouldn't it be amazing to play the music to Halo and Mario and Zelda and Myst and Metal Gear Solid and, and, and Kingdom Hearts and Sonic and let's play all this live and, 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 uh, Again, no one had done it before. So yeah, I'm like, well, I, I, it's it's funny, Tom. It's funny, Tommy. I very distinctly remember being at E3, and we were sitting in that little um, a cruddy uh, uh, cafeteria area, you know, where those tables are, yep. right? Yep. And yep. we and we hadn't seen each other in maybe like a year or two. And yep. and I sat down. I'm like, Tommy, what are you up to? And he's like. I've got this idea and I'm very excited about it. And I want to go and play video game music with a live orchestra. And I'm like, that sounds great, Tommy. You go do that. That's <laughs> like I remember, I remember the moment when you told me about video games live. And, That's funny. And, and, and you know, David Perry always tells a funny story. Uh, for those of you who don't know, David Perry, he's, he's, he's my best friend for 30 years. He was the guy who programmed Earthworm Jim, Disney's yeah. Aladdin the Matrix games, but he's also probably more well known now as the person who created cloud gaming. He, uh, he raised $50 million with his company Gaikai and then sold it to Sony for $383 million. So he, you know, and that, that basically became PlayStation Now. Um, right. and, and so, but Dave always tells the story. He always says, you know, I remember Tommy coming in and he's talking about his, he's going to do this concert and he's going to be at the hall and he wants to do it at the Hollywood Bowl. Hollywood Bowl, yep. 
again, not not just not just like oh, let's do a concert in like Idaho or something for twenty people. It's like you know, my goal was no first show, biggest venue in the world, Hollywood Bowl, one of the best orchestras in the world, L.A. Phil, eighteen thousand seats. That's what I'm gonna do. And I'm gonna get Hideo Kojima from Metal Gear Solid to fly out from Japan. I'm gonna get I'm gonna get uh, uh, Yuji Naka, the creator of the Sonic the Hedgehog. I'm gonna have the Halo team there. I'm gonna have the Nintendo folks there. I'm gonna have uh, the World of Warcraft team. We're gonna we're gonna do debut a brand new thing no one's ever seen or heard. And and again, my my agent at the time, uh, who was who was um, my music uh, for for live shows because we hadn't done a live show yet, but he's a very famous guy in the music industry. And he's there shaking his head like, like Tommy, <laughs> no one plays the Hollywood Bowl as their first show. What you do is, and no one even plays in LA because all that's where all the critics in the industry are. What you do is you play it in, you know, you play it in, you know, Washington or something and then you tune it up, you see what's wrong. But Tommy, the Hollywood Bowl, no, no, no. See, Maybe you tour for 10, 15 years, win a couple of <laughs> Grammy Awards, and then maybe you get invited to play the Hollywood Bowl. This is where the Beatles started. Frank Sinatra, Jimi Hendrix, you know, the greatest of the greats played the Hollywood Bowl. You, no one starts at the Hollywood Bowl. And, 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 uh, and, he, get, and he says, he goes, you, just, you had that look in your eye. I knew it. He goes, I knew it then. And David Perry always says, he goes, he, uh, he says, I remember Tommy telling me about the, he's going to play at the, the Hollywood Bowl. And he says, and then a year and a half later, I'm literally sitting at the Hollywood Bowl watching his first show ever. And, and, and I wouldn't take no for an answer. And I bugged the hell out of, you know, I called the LA Phil. I convinced them what a great idea. Isn't it going to be great that young people are going to come see an orchestra? Oh yeah, we do like that idea. Well, it's great. <laughs> You know, and uh, and uh, and so we did that first show, and and all all of the uh, you know all of the people that I mentioned who were going to be there were there, and then some. Stan Lee came. Yep. Uh, yeah. You know, we had Elijah Wood was there when he was hot with uh, you know when he was big with Lord of the Rings was just coming out. I mean, it was just you know, and again, people thought I was crazy and. So David Perry's fun thing was, you know, when I started, you know, when I reinvented in television here, and now I'm, now we're doing a brand new video game console. And again, people are like, well, look, there's Sony, Nintendo, and, and, and Microsoft. Like, like you, can't, you can't compete with those three people. And I say, why not? Well, because it's impossible. Oh, you mean like, playing the first show at the Hollywood Bowl, doing a, a 20 year television show about video games and winning an Emmy award and a telly award. Oh, you mean like putting out the very first video game contract, uh, 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 video game soundtrack, like impossible like that. Oh, okay, cool. So, so, <laughs> so great, we're doing it then. And, right. and it's interesting, it was, a, it was a pretty big moment, Scott, a couple of weeks ago when GameStop had started promoting the, in television, and the console is called Amico. It's the Italian word for friend. Yeah. Uh, GameStop started promoting it a few weeks ago, and in their stores, even though we're not even launching till October of this year, ten ten. So we're seven months from launch, and they now have five foot posters in any game store you walk in. We're up in the screens and the monitors. We're in all of their circulars that they give out to people. And now, Scott, you tell me, when when was the last time you walked into GameStop? It's red Nintendo, green is Xbox, dark blue is PlayStation. When was the last time you saw a fourth thing color in there? Dreamcast, orange? Yeah, like maybe. 90, right? Yeah. 20, 20 years ago? And now, here we go. And we're there already. And, and so... And again, like David Perry says, I've known the kid, I, I've known Tommy for the same age. I've known him 30 years. I wouldn't bet against him. And, and that kind of confidence, though, if you have that in yourself, you, my friends, are unstoppable. Unstoppable. 
the only person that can stop you is yourself. You get in your yeah. own head. You don't think you're good enough. You have doubts. You have fears. Oh, maybe you don't have the stamina. Screw that. Put it on. And one of my big heroes is Walt Disney. The man. Oh, mine too. Yeah. Right. And Walt, as yeah, you know, yeah. thought, Walt Disney risked everything he had three times in his life. The first one was when they told him he was crazy because he wanted to make a cartoon that had sound in it. They're like, you're nuts. No one that's who cares about sound, blah, blah, blah. And he did Steamboat Willie and it was a big thing. Then he said, I want to do an hour long, hour and a half long movie with a cartoon. They're like, are you crazy? No one's going to stand. Cartoons are three minutes long. No one is going to sit through a stupid cartoon for an hour. Snow White wins an Academy Award. And he's bet everything he had on it. Everything he had. And then the third thing, now, Walt, you finally lost your mind, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Walt says, I'm going to build a place where people are going to go and families will be able to go on rides and do this. We're going to build a theme park and there's going to be rides and everywhere. And, and again, at the time, you have to remember, merry-go-rounds were for kids, right? And there were, you know, and, and so there, were, there weren't, you know, there weren't places where families would go. He invented that. And everyone said he was crazy and he was going to fail. And he risked everything he had all in. Because when you believe in yourself, you know that nothing is going to take you down. Nothing. And so I, you know, I feel the same way about everything I've ever done. And, and, and that second that you doubt yourself, you're done. You're over. So what I would recommend to folks out there, in, to, in order to start building your confidence, what you need to do is set little goals for yourself, very achievable things, right? And you either do it or you don't, right? And, and so it, it could be something as simple as, I want to lose five pounds in the next two weeks. Now, weight is simply mathematics. How much calories are you eating? How much calories are you, are you burning, right? That's it, right? How bad do you want to reach that goal? Are you willing to suffer for it? Are you willing to, to sacrifice for it? Because if the answer is no, and you can't do something like that, then again, you're not ready for the big time. That don't, you know, until you're ready to say, you know what, I'm just stubborn and I am going to get to the top. If my goal is to lose five pounds in 15 days, then I'm going to starve myself if I have to get there, or I'm going to work out for six hours a day if I have to, and I'm only going to eat raw fruits and vegetables if I have to. And you can either do it or you can't. And it's so a great test for yourself is, you know, getting these small goals. And, and I got news for you. Once you get to the top of that mountain, that first mountain that you reach, now you have the confidence going, you know what? I can do anything I put my mind to and nothing except myself. I made it here. And I was the only one that could have stopped me from getting to the top, right? And once you have that confidence and you're at the top of that mountain, it's just a matter of looking around and choosing the next mountain you want to start to climb. And that is it. See now, so here I thought you were starting a, a video game company, but it sounds like you're starting a self-help company. Right. Yeah. It's all good. It's all good advice. All right. So let's so let's apply this to your latest mountain. And that is the Intellivision. Why? Why did you go after that mountain of Intellivision? Why yeah. did you feel that that brand was important to go after? And what is it that you're offering with this? You like you said, you go into GameStop. There is here's Xbox and here's Nintendo and here's Sony. There's three, right? Oh, there can't possibly room, be room for a fourth, right? What yeah. is it about what you guys are making, your vision for this, this system that comes out this October? What is it that, what's so great about this? Let's hear it. Let's, let's sure. hear the pitch. Yeah. So, so, um, 
Uh, by, by the way, I just saw that somebody left and they said uh, that they're out and uh, don't... Uh, <laughs> oh, don't try to lose five pounds in two weeks, yeah. Again, there's a person that just gave up, right? There, there's uh, the... Because <laughs> well, if you weigh 300 pounds, you can't lose five? Come on. Uh, but anyway, it, it's, all, it's, all, it's all percentage anyway, but... Anyway, and, and I was just using that as an example. So so for those who yeah, you know, always hope, always hope, consult what is best for your health, right? That's yes, yes. I, I I hope people understood the 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 example I was making and, and weren't didn't get insulted or whatever. But uh, anyway, um, so yeah, the, the difference is um, the, the difference of course is that um, you know when you look at the modern video game console, Sony, Microsoft, and Nintendo, I found myself in a position where I can't play video games with my dad anymore. I can't play video games with my wife, right? There's no video games that we can play. Uh, the controls- and why, and why is that? Why, why do you feel that way with your wife many, or your dad? Many reasons. The controller is first and foremost. You mm -hmm. put a switch in my dad's hands, you put a PlayStation 4 controller, Xbox controller, dual analog sticks, four shoulder buttons, four side buttons, and a D-pad, he's out. There's no right. way. It's a non-starter. So the controls are complex. The games take too long to get into, right? Um, you know, my dad will never be good at Fortnite. Never, no matter how many times and how many hours he wants to dedicate to it, you know, it, it doesn't have the dexterity as, as, as others do, right? And right. so there's a big, steep learning curve for people who don't play video games to go into home consoles or even PC gaming is even worse and more complicated. And so what us as gamers think of casual games like you could say to me well tommy you know there's a lot of casual games on the switch like casual couch co-op games like for example overcooked right so you say well overcooked and so okay well let me play with my wife and again it's a different mentality we can't ever think as designers that everybody likes what we like right and, and if you're making a game for a specific genre, yes, right? Or for a specific crowd, okay. But when creating a console, you know, that you want the world to love, um, you know, I my wife sat down and played Overwatch and said, well, you know, the analog stick she doesn't like and the too many buttons. But she says, so Tommy, so the, the object of this game, and I love Overwatch cooked by the way i'm not i'm not i love the developer love the game but she says so tommy um so in this game you you cook and clean i'm like well yeah that's kind of that she's like i don't like to do that in real life why would i want to do that in a video game i'm like okay that's a good point and then and then there's the timer that's counting down right you know yeah. timer timer you're under do as much as you can before the timer and for her it's like look i'm under the clock all day long when right. I come home, I want to relax. I don't want to be pressured. You know, I'm just trying to enjoy myself. And now you start to realize why a game like Candy Crush is so popular, right? Especially among, right. among uh, you know, women. You know, guys like to destroy stuff and women like to create things. I mean, that's kind of, you know, it's a general thing. It's true. But it, yeah, it's yeah. kind of, you know, a... a, a and so, you know, when you think about that and, and you know, you think that, wow, you're like I wouldn't have perceived that. So, so that's where our approach is different because all of our games are cooperative. You can, they all have single player, but they also all have couch co-op as well because that has gone away. When the late 90s hit, and the internet entered into our industry, and you remember this well, Scott, multiplayer gaming now meant a kid in a dark room with his headphones on. And it's been right. like that for 20 years, right? Yes, there's some co-op games, but they're not the norm anymore. I mean, Scott and everybody on this call, I would say to you, I, I guarantee that your fondest video game playing memories 
were when you were with someone else. Maybe it was your parents playing Zelda for the first time. Maybe it was Mario Kart with your friends or GoldenEye on the N64, yep. or Bomberman yeah. on the Saturn, whatever, yeah. Dreamcast. Or yeah. was or was my brother and I trying to figure out Dragon's Lair together, right? right. Him, him calling out the moves and me writing them down and we worked together to solve that thing. Exactly. And so, you know, we're seeing that that's gone farther and farther away in our industry, so much so that the very last video game system that came with two controllers, do you know what it was, Scott? Uh, I'm going to guess, although I might be wrong, it, was it the SNES? It was. You're 100% oh my God. correct. 1990. 30 oh, that's ancient. years ago. That was the last video game console that came with. Now, people say, oh, what about the Switch? No, that's one controller that you split into two little crappy things. Um, <laughs> and, and so, so the soup, and what does that tell you? Right? Yeah. That tells you all you need to know. About, and then you look at where the hyper casual market has gone, and it's all in mobile. Yeah. But mobile, it's all is single solitary. player. It's yeah. solitary, just like the console games have become. And let's be honest, it's nothing more than a cash grab. Those games are being designed around how much money they can suck out of you, right? Mm. For the most part, the bigger ones. Right, right. So, and if you look at children's edutainment, it's simply on mobile, but it's kids staring in a screen. What's the number one concern of young parents? That they give their kids too much alone screen time, right? Right. And so right. that is what we are. We're in between mobile and the switch. We're the console that's simple, affordable, family, entertainment. And that spells out the word safe because none of our games have violence. None of them have sexual content. All of the content is rated E for everyone or E plus 10. All of the games are $9.99 or less. No microtransactions, no in-app purchases, no loot boxes, no in-app advertising. You buy the game once, you get it forever. It comes with two controllers that are very simple. They have color touch screens, very simple uh, dial, the, the Intellivision disc, big buttons, motion controls like the Wii. Think of us like the Wii 15 years later almost. But all, right, all yeah. of our games are designed around people being able to pick up and play easy and no matter what your skill level is. When you think of a game like any card game or board game, that you play or dice game that you play with a group of friends. When you go to play that game, everybody is on the same level to start. That's what right. makes it enjoyable. Anyone can win this card game. Anyone can win Yahtzee. Anyone can win whatever, Monopoly, whatever. Yes, there are methods of strategies, but everybody starts out on the same level. Scott, can you say that about 98% of the video games these days? Oh, you know, heck no. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like, it, it's just, it's incredible, the, the, the learning curve to get up to speed. And so that's what we took a look at and created all of our experience. I want grandpa to be able to kick his 20 year old hardcore gamer grandson's ass. That's my goal. How can we make sure that happens, right? Nice. So, so that, so that, so that sounds awesome for the the gamers right this idea that getting the family together getting them to play yeah. these this family oriented uh, uh material you know games together but yeah. what i'm really one of the things i'm really interested in when i was reading and listening to interviews about this is you were talking about the how you got teams to come and make these games and yes. and one of the things that i read is that you are giving dev teams the development kits which has traditionally been a source of revenue for the for the the manufacturer charging them i remember how expensive the old nintendo systems and then they would charge you for yeah, yeah they would charge you for the carts they would charge you then to get the nintendo seal of approval they would like milk you every way they could right so yeah. how we have a lot of game developers that listen to this and 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 have joined us for this Tell us about the experience of making something for the Intellivision. Why, why would we want to make something for your system? 
It's a great question. So what I've done is I've reinvented the ecosystem within uh, the gaming industry in regards to in television. We curate every single one of our games, right? So you talked about it, that Nintendo seal of approval, right? Well, where, what the hell ever happened to that? Where did that go? You know, <laughs> Out the window. <laughs> um, and so we want to bring that back. We're about quality, not quantity. And we're going to curate every game. So what we do is that we pick the best developers in the world or they or developers come to us with their ideas and thoughts. And what happens is we pay for the game up front. Mm. That is now, Scott, as you know, that's the way it used to be in the old days, in, right, in the right. early 90s. But now that model has gotten away where studios either buy, you know, they either buy the studios or indie gamers, indie developers are like, you know, making, uh, you know, they're trying to do a Kickstarter or an Indiegogo or they're bootstrapping everything themselves. Everybody's living in the same dorm room or their mom's house while everybody's trying to save money and they're working part-time jobs, you know, and, and that's a shame. So what we do is we say, look, we like your idea. We like your dream. We're going to fund it so that you don't have to worry about any of that stuff. And we're going to give you a royalty and we're going to give you the dev kit. You don't have to pay for anything. And what I've done here, Scott, is we've created an incredible, talented team of experts in all their fields, over 600 years of video game experience, just in our core team. So for example, Three of the people who did all of the art, the award-winning art for Earthworm Jim 1 and 2, Disney's Aladdin, Cool Spot, Global Gladiators, they work for me full-time. They're my art directors. We've been working together 30 years. So, so how would you like, and then for audio, I'm doing the audio stuff and Joey and, and you know, we <laughs> have our, nice. our, team, our team of audio professionals are here. The people who actually created the, 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 the operating system and the hardware for the machine are all here internally. We give them to you so that you can help optimize. We give you the audio, the best audio folks in the industry, the best art directors in the industry to help you build your dream because we're only successful if they're successful and so right. we're going to give them all of the marketing all of the pr the developers here are the most important cogs in our wheel because we, i could build the greatest machine on the planet but if you don't have the content to sell and and to to make people want to buy your hardware then it doesn't matter so right. we're a very different kind of hardware company because all of us who created the machine came from the development side, the game developer right. side. And, and me and David Perry and all these people, we know all of the things wrong with the industry from a marketing standpoint, from a developer standpoint, from an ecosystem standpoint, from a royalty standpoint, from a dev kit standpoint, from a tools standpoint, from an operational standpoint, from the struggles of indie developers. And what we've done is we said, Let's fix every single one of those problems. We see this huge gaping hole in the video game industry. We know the reasons why there's 3 billion people who play games on mobile, yet only 200 million people that play on home consoles. Think about that for a second. That means that less than 8% of the people who play video games in the world are playing them on Sony, Xbox, or Nintendo, or, right. or NPC as well. What? What? Because when you think <laughs> of video games, you think of PlayStation, you think of Nintendo, right? Sure, yeah, That's yeah. A small portion of people who are playing it. So I don't want to compete with Sony, Microsoft, Nintendo, and now Google, I guess you could say. I don't want, they're, they're fighting over those 200 million people. Let them do that. I want to drive a huge truck through the gaping hole that is those 3 billion people that right. play casual games, but they can't play them with anyone. Right.
So it sounds like as a publisher, you're not just provide, you know, you're not just manufacturing the hardware. You're right. not just, you know, creating this, this um, approval system to make sure that the quality is high, but it also sounds like you're offering this mentorship to yeah. these developers that need it. And that, that sounds amazing to me. So yeah. if I had a, if I had an idea for a game, right? Mm -hmm. I'm a, I'm a game designer. I come up yeah. with crazy ideas all the time. What would be like, what would I need to do to get to whoever at mm -hmm. in television to go, all right, I want, I want in, this sounds great. How, what yeah. can I do? How can I help you, Tommy Tallarico, make there a great game see, for yeah, your yeah. in television? I like how you did that. I see your pain. Yeah. Uh, you go, you basically go to intellivision.com and okay. you go to our contact page and we have an email there for developers. And so okay. you develop that. And, and you might know, do you know Jason Enos? He was at Namco. I, I don't, but that's okay. I, you, it's always yeah. good to make new friends. Yeah, well, Jay, Jason, he was the uh, producer of, uh, the. you might have heard of some of these franchises, but he was at Konami for 12 years. He uh, he, he produced all the Metal Gear Solid games. Solid I've heard of those. He was I've heard of those. He brought Dance Dance Revolution from Japan and brought it to the world. Uh, Castlevania, Contra. I've heard, heard of that. Of some of those. So, so he <laughs> yeah, so, he's, so he knows he knows games. video games. Yeah, he knows video games, yeah. Um, so yeah, you will reach out to him and his team and uh, and and that's and then we'll, we'll sign you up with an NDA, a mutual NDA, NDA and then uh, and then yeah, we start talking from there. And does it and does it matter like if this is a team of you know students who are just graduated or or okay. almost graduated doesn't matter who who it is doesn't matter what their no. experience is so all you have to do is want to make a game uh, yeah and, and having a like if you're a young studio like that you know having a demo is huge yeah. huge you know so having an idea on paper okay it's a good idea but scott right. as you know how do yeah you playable play is always better it? And what's it look like, right? Right, so, right. Yeah. So, so getting, getting, you know, a level or even a video together of, you know, the concept, that is major. <laughs> nice. Sure. Yeah, that's great. So that's good advice. So all of you game developers out there, uh, get that video demo or playable demo, and then that way it's that's a good it's a good business card, right? Like it's a good way yeah. to uh, to get your foot in the door. Well, that's totally. awesome. That, well, that sounds great. I, I, I am really eagerly looking forward to um, uh, playing in television. I've been eyeing the wood grain one yeah. myself. Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm curious to see uh, uh, when it launches. I'll, I'll be there. Cool. Um, so let me so let me ask you about something else that you are involved with. Uh, and that is um, you are a member of the Board of Governors for the Grammys. Yes. Uh, and well, um, not and anymore. I, oh, I, not anymore. I, okay. No. But you were for a while. Yeah. Yeah. For so years. so one of the big things that you did when you were involved with them is you pushed to uh legitimize video game music and and try to get there to be, you know, like a Grammy for best video game score. But yeah. to my knowledge, as that that hasn't happened yet, right? No, no. It, yeah. So what they did is uh they put us with film and television. So it's oh okay film, TV and video games. And in fact, um, uh, we won, the video game industry won. We beat movies and TV. Um, it would have been in 2008. Uh, and it was for Christopher Tin's Baba Yetu from Civilization yeah. Four, And it won the category for best song and it won for best album. And that oh, was that's very, awesome. Yeah, that was the very first video game soundtrack that was, uh, that, that was uh, that won in the category, and Austin Wintry's music for Journey uh, was also nominated for a Grammy, although didn't win that year. But uh, so yeah, no, that happened in 1999. We put that through. Oh well, that's great. That's so it's yeah. so it's actually been so. I, I've noticed that a lot of um, a lot of, originally a lot of composers would. You know, would, some of them were trying to get to do video games, but I've been noticing a lot of people coming from video games uh, or from, uh, yeah, coming from video games into music, you know, like, like Michael 
uh, who started on Call of Duty and yeah. and now is doing Star Wars movies or you know That's something right. crazy like that, right? Yeah. So yeah. like what what you know if you're you know maybe you're a musician. Um, what is what do you see as a good path for musicians if they want to get involved with video games or or if there are video game, uh, you know, people that have already been doing some video games? You know, what what are the options available for them? What what would you what advice would you give somebody who is looking to branch out and, and how, well, how can they do that? So the best the best thing to do when, when people always ask me about, you know, because you have to put up a demo together. Right. And, right. Um, and you don't necessarily have to have, you know, 10 songs that are five minutes long, um, but, you know, have a minute or so um, and have maybe five or six songs, right? Different songs. But here's where people make the mistake. They don't lead with their heart and their passion. And what I mean by that is they put together a, a demo that it's what they think other people want to hear because they say, oh, you know what, I'm going to put, and I'm sure, Scott, you got a lot of demos in your time for musicians, and, you'll, and, and they're all the same, where it's like, here's my orchestral tune, here's my rock and roll tune, here's my jazz tune, here's my, you know, this tune and that tune and my polka tune and, and, and this and that, and they put a whole bunch of different, you know, they're ripping off a bunch of different genres of music. And I never understood that because what I always tell people is put on your demo what you love the most, what you're passionate the most. If you were to do an album of music, what would that sound like? Mm -hmm. That should be your demo. Because if you're really great at polka music, then Go all in on polka. And at some point, somebody's going to need a polka tune. And like, and I'll give you an example. If I'm working, uh, if I'm looking for a, uh, 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 a reggae tune, do I want to hire Joe Hotshot in Hollywood who's going to rip off Bob Marley? Or do I want to hire Joe Rostaman who's like you know three sheets to the wind high off his ass who lives in jamaica and who does this for a living i want that guy i don't want somebody to try to rip off the style i want the right. guy right all right and you so, are authenticity yes and so if you do piano new age music then that's what you should put on there. Don't try to be something you're not or something that you think others want to hear. Variety doesn't mean shit. We want the passion, the heart, you know? Right. I mean, there was a guy who gave me a demo and it was like Zydeco music. And for people who don't <laughs> know, Zydeco is like, uh, you know, like Louisiana. Uh, yeah, Cajun. Cajun music, you know? very distinct and kind of, and I'm like, and it stood out to me. I'm like, holy crap. Like, this is really cool. Zydeco music. And, and, and then I, I had a game, I was working on a fishing game and I'm like, I'm calling this dude up. You know, like, <laughs> I, I, want, I want some Cajun Zydeco for my fishing game. Right. And, uh, and it worked out great. So, so yeah. So don't try to imitate others or or put on there what you think others want to hear do what you're most passionate about because that shines through and i got news for you that's your best stuff yeah you want to put your best stuff on your demo so let's let's talk about speaking of passion let's talk about a passion of yours and one that i have as well spider-man Spider <laughs> yeah let's talk <laughs> about spider-man yeah. so so you have had you you've had um, uh, you got to work. What was that like making music? This is back in what year was this? Two thousand and what? Uh, when was Spider Man? No, Nineteen ninety-eight. Oh, that's right, ninety-eight for PlayStation, right? Yeah. What was yeah. what was it like? You're you're you've made yeah. games. You've been you've been making you know games for a while. Uh, yeah. How did you how did you get that gig? What was it like? Well, I'll tell you, it was really interesting because. So the team I was working with, 
uh, they were never, they were called never saw. And uh, for people who know about the industry, so I was on the original Tony Hawk pro skater team, the original one, the one that blew everything up. And that was with never saw. And so guitar here, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Tony Hawk was now the biggest selling award winning, had every, you know, 22 million units sold across all the platforms and, and all my audio and stuff was in there. And, and so Neversoft says to me, Hey, look, you know, we just got the Spider-Man license. Um, you know, do you want to work on Tony Hawk two or Spider-Man? Now, anyone in their right mind would have said, are you kidding me? Spider uh, are you kidding me? I want Tony Hawk too. Right. The royalties, you know, were crazy. And, and, and I said, Spider-Man, hello. And, um, and I remember we were talking about the storyline and I'm, and I'm like, guys, why don't we just, uh, get Stan Lee to, to read this and do the dialogue. And they're like, we can't get Stan Lee. Are you kidding? No one can get like Stan Lee. Like, where does he even live? And that, like, I don't. Hey, he lives down the street. <laughs> Back then, he wasn't a deal, right? This was before right. the movies, before all that stuff. Like, how do sure. you get a hold of Stan Lee? I'm like, I'll call his ass up. I'm sure, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm sure I'll figure out a way. And and I and I eventually got a hold of him. I forget how even. I think I knew a friend of a friend or something. And I called him up, and I and he answered his phone. Hello, and I said, "Hi, this is Tommy." And and the the way you think Stan Lee is like, he really is in person. Like 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 you know, we would be just hanging. And he became a good friend, a dear friend. So many, you know, I, I probably worked with him probably twenty different times in my life. Everything from being on my TV show to my concerts to video games, but even in like cons, like. Like I knew a lot of convention people and they knew that I knew Stan Lee. So I would, I would hook up his internet in his house when it would go down. I swear to God. <laughs> um, and he would always call me, Hey, Tommy Excelsior. Like I swear to God, I would get, and, and it was funny because he was on AOL and, and Scott, as you know, I was on AOL for a long time. I still have an AOL account. I um, so do I, man. It's now right? it's, now it's retro. <laughs> and now it's retro. <laughs> and so Stan Lee was on, and, and, his, and his AOL account was like comic book man at AOL. It was hilarious. And so we would write each other on AOL all the time. And, and it was funny because um, I showed him a picture. I have a Spider-Man room in my house, as you know, Scott. And, 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 and one of my claims to fame, and I was in Wizard Magazine about this, one of my claims to fame is, I have one of the finest Spider-Man collections in the world. I have every amazing Spider-Man and all of the offshoots, even like Spider-Man 2077. That's how completest I was. Um, everything from Electric Company Spidey Super Stories to Peter Parker, everything. And even the crossovers and the Marvel team-ups. If Spider-Man was in it from 1962, to, to about 2000, I have it and it's in mint con near mint condition. It's one of the finest Spider-Man collections in the world. And so I'm taking pictures and I got Stan Lee to sign inside. I got Steve Ditko as well uh, nice. to sign inside and uh, my Spider-Man one and my amazing uh, Fantasy 15. And uh, not on the covers though, because that's- a Yeah, yeah, no, no. But, yeah, but never, uh, never the covers. <laughs> so I don't do the covers. And, yep. uh, and, and then I got John Romita Sr. as well on some of my things. But anyway, the uh, and so I take a picture of my Spider-Man room and my Spider-Man collection. And, and again, this was right when you could take pictures digitally and email them and stuff. And I remember sending them to Stan Lee. And it's the greatest email ever. I printed it out and I have it, I have it framed in my Spider-Man room. And he, he emails me back and he goes, Kid, you got a problem. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, I love that story. That's awesome. That's, that's anyway, great. Yeah, well, that's cool. That's. Questions.
Yeah, yeah. Let's. Uh, if you have some questions, um, go ahead and post them uh, to the chat. Um, in the meantime, all right, while we're waiting for some questions, I have another question for you. Sure. Uh, and that is, I read, and this is actually something I didn't know about you, which is okay. slightly unusual, uh, that you collect balsamic vinegar. What is yeah. up with that? So, what so is- I, 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 it's, it's, it's DOP, it, it's, it's balsamic, it's traditional balsamic vinegar, which is very, right. very, uh, so so 99% of the vinegars that you see out there are all just phony. It's, it, it's uh, so this is know, like a it, champagne thing, right? Or like, like a like, Parmesan cheese thing, right? There's yeah, only one Parmesan place cheese. you can get it. That's right. Reggio right. Parmesan is what you want to do. And, and so um, traditional balsamic vinegar is only made in a, 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 a region of Italy, uh, which is right near where Ferrari is made. Ferrari is um. made in Maranello, and, and down the street is Modena. And Enzo Ferrari was born in Modena, and, and Lamborghini is there. Uh, Luciano Pavarotti was born there. It's just this amazing. Uh, Ducati is there, Maserati, Lamborghini, uh, and, and Pavani, uh, uh, Pagani all within this uh, this area of Italy, a 10 mile radius. And so balsamic, the real bottles are only uh, by the government has to approve them and they only give it to certain, uh, there's a very, very straight process, very strict and hard process. And every year they'll allow three or four uh, achatayas which which are the places where the vinegar is is aged for for decades decades so when you get to 25 years and they have a 15 year one too but the extra vecchio or the extra long is the the stuff you want to get and they can only bottle them the government has to bottle them so there's no funny business and it's literally just the great must in in about seven barrels that gets passed down from generations. And those go for about $300 a bottle. Wow. So, so what do you, so what do you do with this? Do you, do you like dip your bread in it and eat it? Do you keep yeah. it for like in your cellar? What's the, what's the deal with the vinegar? Yeah, I, I converted my <laughs> wine cellar cause I don't drink. So I converted the wine cellar into a balsamic cellar. Uh, and, okay. uh, yeah. I have about, I have about, uh, I mean, sadly, this is funny to say, but I have about a hundred bottles. So again, do the math on three hundred dollars a shot. So I got about thirty grand in balsamic vinegar that I'll never drink. But again, it's it's like a it's like a wine, but and it's like molasses. It's not right, right, like, thick. Like you put yeah. on salad, you put it on strawberries, you put it on ice cream, you put it on, you know, you put it on food at the end, and you put it on chocolate. You know, so it's yeah. It's, just this amazing, uh, amazing thing. It's, it's, so it's sounds amazing. sounds fantastic. I'll have to come by and try some sometime. When you come by, it'll blow your mind. Your <laughs> mind will be blown, and you'll never be able to touch another vinegar ever again because you know what the real stuff actually is. Right. Like. Speaking of blowing your mind, I have some great questions here. So right. I have a good one from Daniel, sure. and and he says. What advice uh, do you give to game directors when communicating ideas to mus- musicians? Would you usually get more precise instructions or themes to go with, or were you mostly free to the approach? Uh, do you uh, free to approach the music how you wanted to do it? That's a great, fantastic question, and and <laughs> the the greatest music I've ever done is always when I've had free reign, right? Um, and so like Scott, I'll give you an example, like when we were working on Treasures of the Deep, you know, there might be a few notes here and there, you know, that, that you would have or that John Body would have. But for the most part, you let me go. You let me do, do, do your thing, you know, um, because the reason you hire composers and audio designers is because you trust that they're the best at what is going to be done, right? And so um, you don't want to hire somebody to rip off John Williams. You don't want to hire somebody to rip off Nine Inch Nails. 
you're hiring somebody because you believe that they're the best person from the job from a creative level. So, you know, the way I create video game music is I just play the game with no sound at all. And I just wait for things to come into my head. And so if I have a producer or designer saying, hey, we want it exactly to be like this. So my advice would be, let this creative person who you've hired, let them off the leash, at least at the beginning, right? right. And see what he comes up with. And, and because you might be so surprised at what they come back with that, that your mind will be blown. And then, but if it doesn't work out, then you might say, oh, you know what? Maybe here's a couple of tracks that I was thinking about. Here's a couple of styles that we were thinking about that might be good. And then maybe you can use that to kind of be towards a direction. But before you do that, let them go off on your own because they're thinking of stuff that you probably haven't thought of yet. And, and I mean, Earthworm Jim's a perfect example where you know, we were all just trying to make each other laugh. It's like, let me see, Jim is in the asteroids on a rocket ship. What music should we do? No one was ever going to say, let's do banjo music because it's funny, right? But that was what I came up with because I wanted it to be funny. I didn't yep. say, oh, he's in space, let's do Star Wars. No, let's do the opposite because people will think it's funny and it, and it re re reminds yeah. you. So so yeah, and it ended up super that. memorable, right? That's, you yeah. know, that's one of the things that people remember from that game is Correct. that crazy soundtrack. So, well, that's great. Um, great so, so yeah, so give, give the artist free reign, but be ready to give them examples if, if yeah. it goes a little off the rails. Yeah, it's good yeah. advice. I think, I think that's good advice for any creative, right? Any artist yeah. or designer or anything like that. Yeah, um, exactly. And the temp music, exactly. Daniel, you nailed it, right? So many times the first thing is the producer, designer, let's put in temp music. And the, yeah. the bad thing about temp music is that people get used to it too quick and right. you're going to kill and stifle anything new and unique. And what are the yeah. best soundtracks ever that you're, that you're reminded of? It's because they're unique. Not because right. they sound like Star Wars or Nine Inch Nails or John Williams. Not because, oh, this kind of sounds like Raiders of the Lost Ark. Those aren't the ones you remember. The ones you remember are the ones that did something totally unique and different and outside the box. Do not put temp music in. Right. Or even worse, you might influence your musician yeah. to make something exactly. similar like what happened with Ghostbusters, right? Right. Right. Exactly. You know, they they put in Huey Lewis. He wrote Ghostbusters, and then Huey Lewis said, "Hey, you're ripping me off." And yeah, and years, and they're still. I think they're still fighting in they're the courts still, yeah, over that know, one. He won too. Huey Lewis won. Right, right, all right. So uh, Nikhil has a great question, which says networking seems to be hard uh, to start off when a lot. I guess uh, Nikhil has been having some bad experiences with some of the networking where they've encountered some scamming or some other problems. Any advice on how to keep a mindset of making networking work, even after running into some catastrophes? Yeah, you're, you're going to, I got news for you. Uh, is it Nick? Is that Nick's? Nick's yeah, Nick Hill. Nick Hill. Nick Hill. Yeah, Nick. Yeah. Yeah. So Nick, Nick, here's the thing. You're going to run into a hundred catastrophes. It might even be 200 catastrophes. Um, how do you avoid them? By running into catastrophes and learning from that experience, right? Um, you know, because you'll start to see the signs. Um, you know, yeah, not every experience you're going to have is going to be a positive one, and that's okay. And, and, and every time you, you, you fall down, it's the way you pick yourself up that is the key to success my favorite movie of all time is rocky right and it's easy for this is for an east coast italian to say that right but my favorite piece of film history ever is in that 14th round and apollo finally knocks rocky down again and he goes and his arms are in the air and Mickey is telling him, kids, stay down, stay down. 
stay down. And he finally got him beat after all this time. And then Adrian walks out because she hears the, the crowd going crazy because she wouldn't she didn't want to see the fight. So she finally walks out and sees Rocky down on the canvas. And she's like, oh, and, you know, you, you can feel her. her death. But the greatest film in his, the greatest film, I think, ever recorded. And Rocky, what does he do? He pulls his ass up. Nothing was going to stop him against everything and he turns it and he goes turns around and he goes come on come on and the look that apollo creed played by bert young the look that he gave him when he just puts his hands on his hip and he just goes like this i think is the greatest acting and piece of film history ever like you cannot believe that this guy after everything I've done to him, he still wants a piece of me. And that's how you have to approach your life and your career. And so those scammers or bad actors or whatever that you ran into might have knocked you down. So what? So what? You're going to get back up. You're going to go out there. You're going to take what you learned, move that maybe you're going to miss that next jab because you've seen that one coming before and you're going to you're going to go at them and you're never going to quit and that's how you're going to make it nice all right great and, and great advice like getting to know people too nick it's yeah it's making f legitimate friends with right. people right yeah because we're, your friends aren't going to screw you over right i mean right. sometimes we're, they will okay fair enough but, you know, in all the time that I've known Scott Rogers, he's never screwed me over and I've never screwed him over. We have a mutual nope. friendship. We have a mutual respect. And that was something that we cultivated within the first week of knowing each other. Right. And that's yeah. something that, that that is so important when when you when you're when you when you you gravitate to people who are like you, you know, you gravitate. And, and when you have an open heart and an open mind and, and you're passionate about something, guys like Scott, who are also that same way, you're going to gravitate. Scott was passionate. Scott was talented. Scott, you, you recognize each other and, and you become friends. And I trust that Scott's going to treat me right. Scott knows that I'm going to do whatever it takes to treat him right and to make the project great. It's not about the money. It's about the great thing that we're going to create together. Right. That's the most yeah. important thing to me. Whereas Scott will tell you, he works with other audio people and they're like, well, you're, you're going to pay me X amount of dollars for this amount of music and this amount of sound effects. And Scott knows from working with me, I'd be like, okay, let's agree on the number. Great. Now I'm finishing the game. And if, and if there's 20 more minutes that we didn't know about, or there's a hundred more sounds that we didn't know about, I don't care. I don't care. I took this project to finish it and make it great. I'm not going to go back to you and charge you 50 more dollars because there's 10 more sound effects. Screw that. Well, I, I'd also hire you, Tommy, because you'd let me do voices of the characters in the game. That that's, was the other. That's, also true, Steve. <laughs> that's a good networking thing. You want to get the exactly. guy who's paying you in the game. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, speaking of games, so David has a great question, which is, what are your top tips for marketing video games? Now, David, I don't know, you didn't specify whether it was uh, your own games or if you're marketing it for a big system like the Intellivision, but, um, but what would you advise somebody who is maybe still on uh, Kickstarter or on Indiegogo or something like that and trying to get the word out about their game? So there he says, David, that's a perfect example where he said it's for his own game on the PC. So David, oh, okay, knows, great. Yeah, so David knows that when he put his game on Steam and it was on that new release list, probably for about 20 minutes, because there's so much content, right? And it's like, man, I wanted to be discovered. And now that window of opportunity is lost, right? So you got to you got to do it. You got to, you know, start talking to YouTubers. Uh, uh, and, and again, they don't have to be. They, uh, yeah, that's it. I want to I want to play a boxing RPG. Send that stuff to Intellivision, David. I want to I want to take a look at that. I'm serious. Um, 
And so, you know, going the gorilla route is the way to go. Now, if you can save up 500 bucks and, and use some keywords and get that out there on Facebook and, and Instagram, right? Um, you know, and, and you're using boxing, uh, you know, video game, RPG, whatever, you know, to use as, as things and you're, and you're targeting a certain demographic in a certain age group, you know, to get them over to your game that, oh, it's two and a half D. So um, that's great. Cause you know, we have uh, a, a lot of our games are two and a half D um, on, on our system. So that sounds perfect for us. So definitely send us an email. Um, but the thing is um, you, you got to, Get it in the hands, even if, because you know, everybody makes the same mistake and they say, oh, well, who's the biggest YouTuber out there? Oh, let me see if PewDiePie will talk about it, you know, or Ninja. No, um, it's all about find somebody that has a thousand followers who maybe is into retro games or the style of games that, that you're into and, 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 and beg them and ask them and say, hey, can I send you a free copy of the game? And, and, you know, in hopes that if you like it, that you'll talk about it. And you'll find that people that only have like five or 10,000 followers or a thousand followers, whatever, they're always looking for new content and okay. they never get approached by people to cover their content because they're trying to climb the ladder of success themselves. Right. And so, you know, getting to those type of people, but you know what? They have a thousand people and maybe 500 people watch that. And now 500 people know about your game. And if he gives it a good review, boom, 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 boom. So, so yeah, that's, that's, that's a really great way to go is using, you know, social media to advertise, but really using YouTube um, in order to get other people to see your game because everybody's trying to create content out there. Yeah. Yeah. Get, get the word out, get the visuals out. The visuals I think are even more important than oh. the, just, you know, saying, Oh, I've got a game. Yeah. yeah you got a you, trailer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do a trailer, back it up with some gameplay, you know, and, and I would, I would add to that, uh, Tommy is yeah. try to build a community, try yeah. to find like-minded people that are interested in what you're making and then, you know, you're making a family, right? You're making a family of people who love what you're making because in the end, uh, it's always better to have, what do they say, like a thousand dedicated fans than, um, than uh, you know, millions of people, right? You want those thousand people that got your back the whole time. They're there to buy your game and to, and to, and to cheer you on and say, keep doing that awesome stuff that you're doing. So, exactly. uh, and, so and yeah. Consider, consider yourself like a new band, right? You want yeah. people to hear your music before they buy it, right? And, and so, again, putting together, and I would suggest putting together a one-minute trailer so that you can get it on Twitter, the whole thing. So you can get it, you know, it doesn't have to be three minutes. One minute, no. boom, boom, quick, fast, exciting, nice music, nice graphic visual effects, you know, and, 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 and you hit them from the start you hit them right from the beat one from right from the start you make it exciting because that then becomes your advertisement as well that's your commercial uh, right. also and you start getting that out there and people start uh you know and again be bold be that homeless kid who walked into the manager's office at guitar hero you know and so uh, at a guitar center uh you know tweet your your boxing game to HBO, tweet it to Sugar Ray Leonard, tweet it yeah. to Mike Tyson, tweet it to a thousand different boxers who have accounts. One of them is going to like it and look at it. And, 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 and then he tweets that to 10,000 other people. It's got to start somewhere. You gotta, right. you gotta grind my friends. You yeah. Gotta grind. yeah. Yeah. Who knows, who knows where anything will lead, right? It's, it's, yeah. You know, half of the opportunities that have come up in both of our careers were things that, you know, later on, as you think about it, you're like, I did not expect that to happen at all. But but it did. 
And that's you gotta uh, and, think outside the box. You got to yeah. be different. You know, Scott, you remember back in the 90s, I'd walk around E3 ah. with a gold LeMe Elvis jacket on. Yep. For yep. no other reason. And you and I you had like circus performers following you around wherever you I went. Had, we had <laughs> pretty girls and models and and bodyguards and 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 performers and and it was a, it was a walking circus, right? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And, and for the only reason was, you know, it was fun, but I wanted people to go, who the hell is that? Cuz this was before people were getting names and credits and stuff. But who is yep. that guy? You know? And and that's how I I be, and and people were taking pictures of me and people were putting me in magazines and yep. you know, on and well, on that's, and on. That's so, where I first saw you. I saw you in a magazine and I read an article and I said, who the hell is this guy? <laughs> Tommy Tallarico, right? So there you go. So that's, that's all right. So you so you I I have I have a question for you, and that is, you know, in my mind, Tommy, you've been a rock star long before you were a rock star, right? Uh, you know, you've been playing rock concerts now for what you say, twenty years. 20 you've been years. doing the yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Congrats, man! So, what yeah. is what is your favorite song to play live at that uh, concert? Yeah, I mean, it would be cheap to say my own, like from Earthworm Jim. So <laughs> I won't. I'll skip that. Um, I, I love, we opened the show with Castlevania and I did a oh. Castlevania rock. Uh, so where, you know, I took four of the greatest Castlevania songs, Vampire Killer and all, all the, and I, I mashed them together in a three minute thing, pipe organ, orchestra, drums and bass and guitar. So it starts out bum, bum, and I go, ladies and gentlemen, bum, boys and girls Castlevania and it's just the energy because people are like okay we're going to this video game show and it's a symphony do we clap do we be quiet like how do we don't like they have no idea what they're about to experience and so I didn't want to I don't want to start out with like you know, oh, here's Kingdom Hearts, da 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 da, da right? No, I, I I hit them right in the face. They don't have <laughs> no idea what's coming. And all of a sudden, all the lights go on, and there's this crazy guy on guitar and rock and roll and the orchestra and the pipe organ and Castlevania, and they're jumping out of their seats. So to <laughs> me, that, you know, that adrenaline rush, that adrenaline flow of that, first 10 seconds and, and you can just feel the energy so castlevania is probably my, my would be my answer nice nice well I, I look forward to getting to the show one day live i've watched many recordings of it i just i to my regret i've i have yet to attend but once uh maybe will you have a show coming did you just have it or it's coming up no, in I, texas I have, a show, I have a show in texas next week next saturday uh in nice. lubbock texas yeah it's the first show back after a year uh, yeah, know, because of COVID, and it's probably the only show we're doing this year. And you know, because you know, Texas was like, yeah, we kick COVID's out. We know Texas, COVID isn't allowed in Texas. Uh, no, but um, so yeah, that's that's uh, definitely uh, probably our only show this year. So, and it's all social right. distance, and they only sold every three seats, and everybody's got to wear a mask. So it's good. It's very, uh, you know, it's it's, it's a little uh, unorthodox the, the how we're doing the performance, but. And all the musicians are even uh, spaced apart six feet. So, but it'll be fun to, to get back out there and, and give people some uh, little bit of normalcy, hopefully in their lives. Right, right. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to hear everybody is being safe and uh, I'm sure it's going to be an amazing show. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry I won't be attending, but maybe in okay. 2022, I'll, uh, I'll get Absolutely. out there. Absolutely. Um, so, um all right. So I'll, I'll, we're getting close uh, to the end here. This has been an amazing uh, two hours with you, Tommy. Uh, I will wrap it up with uh, my last question, which is what is next for Tommy Tallarico? In television, we're going to we're going to we're going to come out with this system this year. And, you know, I got the next seven to 10 years to, to make it uh, to sell tens of millions of units. That that's my goal right now. Is, right is making television great which uh which of the titles so uh, you know when i go to buy my my uh console at on 1010 
2021. Uh, yeah. And I, I pick up that wood grain uh, edition of the uh, Intellivision. What uh, what games do you recommend that I go for? What are your what are your some well, of your we, star titles? So we we have six games right in the in the system. They come. Oh, which ones are those? System, uh, Astro Smash, Shark Shark, Farkle, which is a dice game, uh, Cornhole, right. Skiing, and an unannounced sixth game that we're announcing ah. uh, later this year. Um, and so it really depends. The way to answer that question is depends on are you going to be playing the first time with with yourself by yourself or are you going to be playing with someone else? So no, it's with my family we're... because that's Amico right. is family, right? right? <laughs> exactly. So if you're playing with your family, you know, even something as simple as the dice game, because it's really cool because right. you got the screen and and so you're you're rolling the dice, you're 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 you know, moving the dice here and you're hearing the vi you're hearing the dice out of the speaker and the vibrations are in the thing. And then you just throw it up on screen and then the dice appear on the screen. Uh, so just that's a little like wow moment. But but cornhole is another really fun one. You know, the beanbag toss. Sure. Yeah. It's like we bowling, you know, like so. So if you're with your family, but if you're by yourself and you're, you know, you're more of a gamer. Astro Smash is so beautiful. The music is so powerful. And it's just, and anyone can jump in. You play up to four players. It's one to four players. Anyone can jump in at any time. That's a, a really nice uh, one. And so those all come with the system. So, nice. right out of the way. but if you're an old school gamer like, like me and you, I know you'll probably love Moon Patrol. Uh, oh, right. Yeah. 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 Classic. It's amazing. Night Stalker is another good one for gamers. Huh. Cloudy Mountain, which is the old D and D game. Uh, All right, yeah, that. television D and D. Yeah, cool. So we got that. So uh, yeah, there's some there's some big ones out there. Some really nice. And ones. and will you be taking a break from your presidential duties to compose any music for any of these games? I'm the audio director on 50 games right now. So that's <laughs> yeah. So that's what I do on the weekends. Yeah, nice. <laughs> for the last two years, for the last two and a half years. I do the audio design with Joey and, and I'm the music director and every once in a while I'll, I'll write a tune here and there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's the fun awesome. Part. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm sure it is. Day, right. A CEO of a hardware company, you can imagine like, you know, I like, so I created designed this machine and got all these smart people to make it for me. We have like 55 employees, but you know, like my, my daily life now is, is kind of, and I, I designed, you know, 90% of the games, co-design 90% of these games. And so, so during the day though, it's all like spreadsheet meetings and legal and marketing and investing meetings and, and contract manufacturing and, you know, all this stuff. So it's like, what have I got myself into? No, but uh, <laughs> no, but so there's a lot of that. And then at night and early in the morning, I'm doing a lot of the design stuff and producing stuff. And then on the weekends, I'm doing audio. <laughs> and again, that's Ooh, man. I love it though. it's not a good right. job to me. It's what I love doing. I'm excited. I'm passionate about it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And that definitely, I mean, you know, I, I already knew that, but it definitely shows, uh, you know, that passion. Wow. Well, Tommy, I mean, we have like barely scraped the surface. It's, you know, <laughs> you have an amazing career. We haven't even talked about you know, 295 of the games that you worked on. But so maybe another time, you know, in the future, um, uh, we can have some other programming to talk uh, about too. all of those. But, um, but man, it's uh, it's so great to uh, see you. It's so great to hear from you. Um, you're just, you know, you're you're killing it as always. Uh, I'm really proud uh, to hear uh, of all, you know, it's just always, I'm never surprised. Like Dave Perry, I'm another one of those. Ah, I'm not surprised. It's it's right. Tommy. Yeah. There but um, but thank you uh, so very much uh, for joining us here. It's it's been a real pleasure. I hope everybody that was watching us live enjoyed it, and everybody uh, who watches this on YouTube also gets the benefit from all your awesome advice. And if anyone wants to reach out to you online, is there any way, like a good way, to reach you or follow yeah, you? Yeah, I'm on, I I'm on Twitter, Tommy Tellerico, uh, and people can message me there. Uh, Facebook's a little tougher to, to, to get me, but, but Twitter's probably the easiest or Facebook. Okay. 
Um, and then my website is Tellerico.com. Right. And then if Before, anybody is a aspiring developer, they can reach out uh, through the Intellivision website. Yep. Yep. There's a developer's nice. channel for that. Yep. All right. Well, take, take it up, man. Tommy's looking for people. He's looking for your game, that boxing game. Go out there That's and... Uh, and, uh, and pitch it out there. Well, thank you everybody so much uh, for a huge hand for Tommy Tallarico. And um, we thank you again for uh, uh, attending our Masters of Game Design. Uh, everybody, please uh, stay safe and we'll uh, see you at the next one of these. Take care, everyone. Mm -hmm.